Hi, uh, this presentation is about subretinal fluid drainage during scleral buckle. And the question is, during a segmental scleral buckle, should we drain the subretinal fluid or not to drain? Two facts are important. First, if we drain the subretinal fluid, you end up with a better tear buckle relationship. But there is a 10% risk of subretinal hemorrhage. And that's the problem. If this hemorrhage reaches down to the macula, then you'll have permanent problem with the vision. So what shall we do? Drain all cases? Some cases? No drainage? Patients uh, for subretinal fluid drainage is different from one surgeon to another. The main indications uh, are chronic retinal detachment, where the fluid is difficult to absorb um, and will take a long time. My second indication as well is cases with high detachment where at the end of the surgery, I would expect a poor tear buckle relationship. This is an interoperative view of retinal detachment. That's the view after placement of the buckle. And that's a satisfactory view. The area of interest is well on the buckle. Although there appears to be more fluid behind the buckle, this fluid is being pushed backward from the buckle, and that's fine, and it will absorb. There's no need for drainage. As shown in the diagram on the right side, if the buckle at the end of the surgery does not appear to be supporting the peripheral retina where the break is and there are retinal corrugations that are not conforming to the buckle, then it's unlikely that the buckle will work without drainage. When selecting the drainage site, you want to be at the most dependent part of the retina as much as possible. Other things to consider is that the coil vasculature is dense near the vertical recti, so the vortex veins are there. So you want to be more towards the horizontal recti. Because subretinal hemorrhage is the main complication that we worry about from subretinal fluid drainage during buccal surgery, you may also want to consider uh, the location of the detachment. For example, the subretinal hemorrhage is more likely to reach down to the macula and would be of a, a problem if the detachment is temporal, superior, and if the macula is off. So it's probably safer to drain an inferior nasal macula on detachment. Again, something to take in consideration. There are two main techniques for subretinal fluid drainage. One is a cut down, the other is a prank. Cut down, the sclerus cut down till the choroid is exposed and then the choroid is penetrated with diathermy or laser. In the prank technique, the sclera and the choroid are penetrated with a needle so the entry in the choroid is small. As one would expect, the cut down technique is more efficient. There is less risk of bleeding because the choroid is prepared but there is a higher risk of incarceration because the hole in the choroid is large. The opposite is true for the prank technique here. This is why one has to put pressure on the eye to raise the intraocular pressure before, during and after uh, nicking the choroid in the prank technique. It's important if you're considering drainage to have intravitreal air or gas ready so as to correct the hypotony after subretinal fluid drainage. The uh, use of air or gas could also have a tamponade effect, augmenting uh, the buckle effect. I'd like to acknowledge that I've used diagrams in this uh, presentation from uh, this excellent book by Dr. Paul Sullivan. There's an e-book, it's completely free, and it's in my opinion one of the best books on vitreoretinal surgery.